growth and the forward progression of our church. If you're visiting with us, our next next day, I believe, is at, uh, in the first of no, first week of November, I believe. And so, really excited, guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much, folks. I got 33 minutes and 11 seconds to give you a word that's burning in my heart, really burning in my heart. And so, I, I ask you if you could just go ahead and sit on the edge of your seat, get something to write on or something to type on or whatever. And this is the first message to the message series entitled what's in it for me what's in it for me what's in it for me and 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 normally you know i would never choose such a title because i am my philosophy in ministry and my philosophy in in the kingdom of god i have a certain code that i live by and um if you haven't noticed maybe i get very uh, passionate and emotional when it comes to the causes of the kingdom of God. And to me, I believe that if a person is going to be a Christian, they need to be a Christian 150% through and through. Somebody say yes. And to me, if, if anybody asking what's in it for me being a Christian, um, to me, it, it could be a little offensive. But I now I, I do understand that we live in the Western world and and especially in this beautiful country that we live in that we're so blessed and 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 most people tend to do things and they go after things if there's something in it for them. And so I figured I need to an answer this question and try to continue to encourage you, edify you, and even maybe even shift the way that you think. Because if I can shift the way that you think, if I can shift the way that you process, if I can alter the way that your cognitive thought processes occur in your mind when you make decisions and I can steer them toward the kingdom of God, it might be that you might connect with the purpose that God's called you for your life. So what's in it for me? And with that comes other questions, which is like, where's my part? How do I play into this God thing? Besides heaven, what else, what do I gain here? What do I gain here? Does God have a plan for me? Uh, what does it involve? Is there a price to pay? What's in it for me? All these questions, we all ask them. We all ask these questions. So I want to answer all these questions. I want, to, I want to reveal to you what's in it for you. Are you ready? Say, yeah. Father, in Jesus' name, I need your help. I need your help to release this word. So, Father, I ask you, Lord, I pray over the people that they receive this word with faith. May it go down into their hearts, take root, and bear good fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to welcome those that are watching us online. Welcome to Discover Life Church. We pray that you're blessed in this message. About 1998, I am a young evangelist traveling, and uh, I'm preaching, and I get into a, a time in my in my ministry and, 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 and in the season that I was in, where I wanted to define what my place was in the body of Christ. What was my responsibility? I, yes, I, Lord, you call me to ministry, but how can I, me as Manny Rivera, how can I know exactly what the will and the purpose and the calling of God is for my life? And how can I help people get there? So I get to studying, and I get to researching, and, and I keep hearing the word, find your place, find your place, find your place, find your place. And so what I did was, I, you know, be, this is before Google, okay? Uh, uh, <laughs> I got this big, giant, strong concordance, and I looked up the word place all throughout the Bible, and I began to look for concepts and scriptures and definitions of the word place, both Hebrew and in Greek. But then I came across one scripture that the word place was different. The word place was different than the other words that were named place. Because you have a word place.
place, that basically means a location. But the word place in the book of Numbers, of all places. And this changed the trajectory of my ministry. It changed the way I view things. <coughs> and it's helped me to help others locate their purpose. Most people don't find devotionals in the book of Numbers. <laughs> book of Numbers, it's like you read it, it's like, oh, Lord, Jesus, I feel like I'm called to Deuteronomy. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, 1,000 people, 1,000 soldiers, 1,000, you know, I mean, I just, it just keeps going on. But the book of Numbers gives us, watch this, God's order, God's plan, God's prescription, God's recipe. And I need, you to, I need us to understand one thing. I need us to understand one thing. Whoa. I promise to you that was the microphone. All right. I need us to understand one thing here. Now, listen. The Old Testament, and in particular, the children of Israel, their, that picture of the children of Israel and their movement toward the promised land is a type of the church today. When we read scripture, please remember and try to, when you read in particular the Old Testament, read it with a Christocentric mindset. It'll help you understand and interpret what's happening. Um, we have to understand the power of types and shadows. And types and shadows basically mean that what occurred in the Old Testament, it all pointed toward Jesus. And so we have to, when we read the historical messages, find the Jesus fingerprints all throughout it. And if you can't, then there's all kinds of books that have already done that for us. It can help us get there and understand. And so when we read about the children of Israel, understand that the children of Israel basically means Israel. They are a type and a shadow of the church today. Somebody say yes. yes. So then it took me to Numbers chapter 2. And it begins to explain in detail the, the way that Israel needed to move forward in the wilderness. After they were set free from Egypt, after they crossed the Red Sea, after Pharaoh was drowned in the Red Sea, they needed to move forward. You need to, after you were born again, after you got baptized, you need to move forward in the place where, come on somebody, are you hearing me? You need to move forward to the place of, of, of productivity, to the place of calling, to the place of purpose. And so God gave Israel a certain instruction of how to move forward, of how they were to set up camp, break down camp, and how they were to march forward into their, into their promise. And it said this, Numbers chapter 2, verse 17. Then the tent of meeting, say tent of meeting, which means the tabernacle. The place where they meet, the place where they worship. Are y'all hearing me? It's church. Somebody say church. Then the tent of meeting and the camp of the Levites. Levites were the priest. Hmm. Everybody do this with me. Hmm. Every time you see Levites, you need to get a mirror, stick it in front of your face, and go, boom, yakalaka, that's me. You are a priest. That's right. But I'll get to that in just a little bit. Then the tent of meeting and the camp of the Levites will set out in the middle of the camps. In the middle of everything going around in their life. Most people have church as an outside thing. As one of the spokes of the wheel. Compartmentalize Christianity. Oh, I think we need to get back into church again. What do you mean get back into church? What about being a born-again believer? Church is not something that you do. Church is who you are. I'm trying to preach, and y'all ain't helping me, but I'm going to keep on going. And so, so they will, in the middle of the 
camps. In other words, the church, who you are, is central to your whole life. But I'm going to keep on going. They will set out in the same order. Somebody say order. order. I should have highlighted that and bolded that one. Order. Order doesn't mean that it's man's order. Order means God's prescription. Because yeah, right. mm, if God says you got to jump and, and, and dance on top of your chair during worship, then you got to do fulfill God's order, not what man thinks needs to be ordered. There's some people in this church that have told me that they came from a church that if you raise your hand, everybody stops and looks at you during worship. That's man's way of doing things. That's man order. I'm talking about God order, but that's that's another sermon. And out in the same order as they in camp, each in their own, each in their own, each in their own, each in their own, under their standard, under their banner. There's so much there. Let me just move forward. Tent of meeting, I want to concentrate on that. The house of God, where God speaks to man. The place of corporate gathering. That's called Discover Life Church. Levites are the priests of God. The priest of God. That's who you are. Now, you got that diagram. Throw that, you got that diagram up there. You got to be able to put that up there. Boom. Now, here's, this is how they camped. This is so exciting. I get really, really excited about this. I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a Bible nerd, okay? Now, this is exactly how God told them to camp. The children of Israel, they were 12 tribes, okay? 12 tribes. And then there were the Levites who were the priests, okay? And so, and then in the middle was the Holy of Holies, what we call the tabernacle, the plate, the place of meeting, the tent of meeting, okay? And so this... This, this should be your life right here. This, these are all, your, all the things that you might be involved in, okay? But who you are, you are a Levite that you centralize your place in the presence of God. See, you are, this is who you are. You are, you are not a, a, a business person. You are a born-again believer. Oh, by the way, you do business on the side. You might, you might like, like Ronald, he works for Amazon. He works for Amazon. Amazon's a great company. I get most of my stuff from Amazon. So when I buy stuff on Amazon, I'm supporting the Edisons. I'm putting food on their plate. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but see, he, he is not an employee of Amazon. Who he is is a man of God called for the purposes of God. Oh, by the way, he works for Amazon. Because who he is, he's a Levite. He's a Levite, and his focus is always on the presence. His focus it's always on the house of God. His focus is there. So as priests, we have to understand what our place is. Well, check it out. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. First Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people belonging to God. That you may be declared the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are a priest. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm a priest. So all of us as priests, we have to understand our place. Touch your neighbor and say place. place. Throw it on the screen. In order to know what's in it for you, we must understand our place. As the priests of God, within the place that God has planted you. Find your place. If I can get you hungry And thirsty to know your place in the place that God's planted you in, I don't have to worry about you backsliding. I ain't got to worry about you getting all bored and stuff and causing all kinds of gossip and issues and situations and drama for your mama. We ain't got to worry about any of that because I have people who are focused and determined and hungry and seeking the Lord and searching his word to find their place in the place where God's planted them. Touch your neighbor and say, it's all about placement. Each in their place under their standard. Can you imagine the kind of church we would have if we had people hungry and thirsty to know their place? Where do I belong? What am I supposed to do? God, I'm hungry. I want to be discipled. I want to be disciplined. I'm thirsty to figure this thing out. Can you imagine if everybody was in the place that God has called them, they were doing it with all of their heart? 
They were under their standard. They were under their flag. They were under their tribe. The way I view this universally, that's, that's the picture of the universal church. Each tribe is a local church, but that's another sermon within itself. I got to keep on moving. Now, let's go into the word place. Throw it up there. The word place. Well, pastor, place, yeah, where I belong. Oh, no, it's deeper than that, folks. Each man, each person was in their place. The word he is the Hebrew word yad. Say yad. yad. When I initially read this in 1998, I had to double take. I went, what? And immediately the Lord began to download incredible things into my spirit. The word place is the word yad, which means the open hand of God. It's when you are in the right place, God opens up his hand over you, indicating the power, provision, and the direction of God. The power, the provision, and the direction. The power, provision, and the direction. It's in him, our calling, our purpose, our response. God, the place of God is when we discover our place in him, our calling, our purpose, our responsibilities in the kingdom. When we realize what needs to be done, and, and that he waits for us to do it. God will open his hand. Provision. God will provide us with power. He will provide us with provision. And he will always give us direction. So what's in it for you, you ask? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? In our walk with God, when we're in our proper place, spiritually and physically, we position ourselves to receive power. Say it with me. Provision and direction. What's in it for you? I'm telling you what's in it for you. It's a life fulfilled in God's purpose. And in, within that purpose, there will always be his power when you're weak, his provision when you're lacking, and his direction when you are lost. What's in it for us is that we can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. Because he is our provision. He is our strength. And he is our direction. So let's talk about this God thing. Direction. Yes, my, my message series is a three-part message. What's in it for you? Power, provision, and direction. I'm going to talk about direction, and I have 15 minutes can do this. Watch this. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Just, just read it along on the screen or write it down on your notes. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I'm a Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here to fight me. If he kills me, then he will be, then, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Enter David. 1 Samuel 17. Now Eliab was his oldest brother, David's oldest brother. His oldest brother heard when he, when, when he spoke to the man, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David as he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? What happened was David was sent by his dad to deliver some cheese to his brothers who were supposed to be fighting, but they weren't fighting. They were just sitting there listening to Goliath speak. And it's been already almost 40 days, and no one's doing anything. It's a standstill. David kept asking, why, why? Why aren't we fighting this guy? Eliab got mad at him. I know your pride and your insolence of your heart, for you have come down here to see the battle. Eliab thought that David would just come there to see a fight. I love verse 29. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? I'm going to combine something here. When you hear the word direction, you should always hear the word cause. Are y'all breathing? 
Okay. We got some crazy causes in, in the culture that we live in, in this politically charged culture that we live in. Our culture is beginning to reach new levels of crazy people. It really is. Every, everyone has a cause. Everyone, we, 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 we have causes and don't even know what, the, what these causes are about. We got people who protest. Protesting now is in style. If you want to be in style, you just protest whatever. I don't know, just protest. Because if you ask any of these protesters that are protesting anything now, they really don't know what they're protesting about. And in some cases, some of them are paid protesters. When I ask kids, why do they do what they do? Kids, they go, because. Have you ever had a kid tell you because? Because in their immaturity, they have a cause, but they don't know what the cause is about. That's because. Because I have a cause. Let me give you some crazy causes that are happening right now that people are even giving money to. Here's one cause. It's, it's, it's called the cause of lobster empathy. PETA, which is the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, they want to buy a retired jail in Maine for $200,000 to set up as a lobster empathy center. For all, the, all of y'all who love lobster, wouldn't you love to invest in that? Get all the lobster you want. Here's another crazy cause. The cause for the Bill of Rights for Plants. The Swiss government's Federal Ethics Committee of Non-Human Biotechnology has issued a document outlining the ethical treatment of plants. This is how you're supposed to treat plants. You've got to sing to them. You've got to love them. You've got you to do certain things to them. That's a cause. Let me give you the craziest cause that I've read yet. The cause of negative portrayal of snakes in movies. I am not lying. This is an actual cause. Movies like Snakes on the Plane have given snakes a bad reputation. The world is hungry for direction. The world, and I'm going to say it again, the world is hungry for direction, but yet Christians get bored in church. Direction is very, very important. We live in a country that has given us the opportunity to go beyond just surviving to live and into a place where we can choose the direction of our lives. Do you see the freedom that we have, how awesome it is to live in this country that we get the opportunity to choose what we want to do instead of just trying to figure out how we're going to live? Why? Because direction in life is identified by the taking up of a cause. Believe it or not, our cause is defined by the things that bring us anger. Our cause is defined, defined by the things that aggravate us the most. Our cause are the things that we really don't understand. We don't understand them, therefore it makes me angry. Therefore I am caused by the Lord to pursue. Stand. And these are the there's a lot of things that I just don't understand. And these are the things that drive my direction for my cause. I can't understand why people believe it's okay to kill the unborn children. I don't understand that. I don't understand why a nation will ignore God, God's laws in protecting the sanctity of marriage, the life of the unborn, and our religious rights. There are so many things I don't understand. I don't understand how a man chooses not to father his own children. I don't understand why a person hates another person because of the color of their skin. I don't understand why teenagers choose to cut their beautifully, wonderfully made bodies. I don't understand how we can go through life with no rhythm or reason, with no purpose. I don't understand why some pastors have to beg people to give when God has given them everything. I don't understand why churches split. And why people choose to live in dishonor. Psalm 73, 16, 17. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. So, what's in it for me? What's in it for you? Direction. Direction. Because direction is everything. Direction is everything. God wants to give your life direction. He does because your direction is your cause, and your cause becomes your direction. 
Mm. I need direction. We need direction. You see, I don't understand the harming of children and the raping of women. I don't understand. I don't understand entitlement. I don't understand why people feel entitled for what they have not earned. I don't understand why people try to rewrite the oldest living document and twist it for their convenience. And it's not the Constitution. I'm talking about the Bible. I don't understand selfish thinking or religious-minded people. I don't understand choosing to never catch a vision and living a mundane life without adventure. I do not understand that. That's why I have a cause. I don't understand not desiring to be better. I don't understand not having a passion to go deeper. That's why God's caused me to bring people to a place of understanding and realize that Jesus is the only way. Why? On the screen, understanding direction defines your cause. I do. Understanding direction defines your cause. But this is what I do know. This is what gives me direction. Understanding my place, the yard of God, which is my place in Christ, my place in his body, my place in this church, my place with the, with the church, positions me under his open hand that gives me direction. It gives me a cause. It gives me a cause. And it should give you a cause. Why? Because Christ is our understanding. Christ is our direction. Therefore, Christ is our cause. Christ is our cause. It's called the gospel. It's called understanding the power of forgiveness. It's called understanding freedom of the cross. It's called understanding that he loves me. It's called understanding that we were once blind, but now we see. It's understanding that we don't have to hate anymore. Understanding that we're no longer slaves to sin. Understanding that our life is not our own. Because your understanding is your direction, and your direction becomes your life's cause. So going back to David. You got David and Goliath. You see, David was standing before his brothers when word got out about his questions. You say, Pastor, what were his questions? Well, let me, re let me remind you of the story. He gets there with the cheese, right? And he begins to ask the questions. What will be given to the man who slays this giant? David started asking, what's in it for me? Wait, 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 y'all ready for this? Watch this, watch this, watch this. David says, he asked one person, and the person said, I, I believe that um, you'll pay no taxes. He asked another person, what will be given to the man who slays this giant? You get to marry the king's daughter. Stop. Rewind. Do you remember the story then when David was with the sheep and God speaks to Samuel to go to Jesse's house, David's father, for there you will anoint the next king. Y'all remember he went through all the brothers. And Jesse didn't even bring David in front of Samuel's presence. And Samuel said, it's easy to look, to judge upon the cover. But God, the man looks at the, the outside, but God looks at the heart. Y'all breathe and say, yeah. So then he pulls David out of the sheep and brings him. And then he gets anointed. What does David do? He goes back to shepherding sheep. That's another sermon for later on. I got three minutes and 41 seconds. Now stay with me. He goes back. So what does David do? He goes back to protecting the sheep and worshiping God, writing music and being faithful. 
staying in the presence and serving his father's house. Staying in the presence and serving in the house. And then the opportunity comes in the form of a giant that's defying not one people but the whole army. And then David says, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? But it's not that David wanted not to pay taxes or to marry the wife of, 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 uh, of Saul. David looked at his word and said, God, could it just be? Could it be that this is my road toward my promise? This is my, I love it, moment. Are y'all hearing this? Say yes. And what did he do? He took over. He had a cause. What did he do? He took it personal. He took it personal that all the soldiers' training had gone to waste. He took it personal that, that his family would become slaves to the Philistines. He took it personal that someone was defying the, the God of Israel. He took it personal that he had come to see his brothers and his brothers they were supposed to be. Who they thought, they, that he thought they were supposed to be. He took it personal that intimidation had devoured the very ranks of Israel's great army. Here's my question to you, and I'm going to end it here. Some of it. Will you take it personal? Will you take it personal that children are being murdered? Will you take it personal that teenagers are living their lives outside of God, but yet we worry about drama and religion and who's who and what's doing what? When we ask to pray, only five people show up. so worried and, and deceived and we're like Eliab and, his, and all the nation of Israel. We sit there and we do nothing because we're being defied by a giant that God says he's already defeated. You know, we have enough people in church taking things personal. We get more upset when our leadership asks somebody to show up on time than for the people who just committed suicide this past weekend. God help us. God help us for our stupidity and our selfishness. Get all worried and messed up because we were asked to serve one more extra Sunday a month. And yet people are dying, going to hell. God help us. David was a teenager. He was shunned by his family, laughed at by a giant, and reprimanded by a king. But he had a cause. He had a cause. He had a cause. One kid took a person and became the most, became more powerful than the greatest soldier in the land. What's in it for you? God wants to give you a cause. Forgive me for my passion, but this, if I get one more person ever ask me, God, Pastor Manny, pray for me. I, I, I just, I don't know what to do. You can't. 
why she wrote on the screen, living contained in a box of selfishness will always diminish the land that you must possess. When we take it personal, when will we take it personal? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And I love you, church, with all of my heart. I do. But if you are sitting in your chair and you judge me for my passion, may God help you. Help you. May God help you. May God help you. May God help you. If you judge me for my passion, then you need to identify the religious cesspool that you're in. Identify it. Look around you because it's sucking you into hell. Sucking you right down into hell. But we need to be a church that can look past all this religiosity and go for the heart of people. Go for the heart of God who will, who will bow down and intercede and pray for this region. Yeah, there might be a lot of churches, but 85% of the people in this region right now, if Jesus was to come back, 85% of them will be in hell. You see how passionate I am about Jesus, how passionate I am about, about building a, a church that we can rescue families, we can rescue teenagers, we can rescue people over this region. I am so hungry for a church who is, who is, who is tired of just playing church games. Is there not a cause? 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 A cause. Stand to your feet, please. honest with you? I think I've been honest all day. This is in my heart it's so strong because I've realized through my time of devotion and meditation that I've realized that I've, as a pastor of Discover Life, I've, I've entered into a place where I am becoming more maintenance driven. And that's not me. I get weird and crazy when I always feel like I have to be under the hood of this church fixing issues that need to already be fixed in God's presence. I'm not called to lead a church, lead a church of dysfunctional, high maintenance people. I'm called to lead a church who are soldiers for Jesus. That's what I'm asking, God. That's what I'm asking. That's my prayer for you. So if your life gets really, really crazy, that's Pastor God answering Pastor Manny's prayer. Because I'd rather pray that whatever it takes, prayer over your life. Lord, whatever it takes, but that marriage will come together in the name of Jesus. Lord, whatever it takes, but those teenagers will honor you and serve you. God, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, God, whatever it takes, which means that you can't wait for your pastor to make the adjustment for you. You're going to have to find the adjustment and then go after it. Go after it. You're going to have to find yourself a cause. If your cause is just surviving, you're not going to make it because this kingdom of God was not designed for survivors. They were designed for kingdom overtakers is called more than a conqueror. You are designed and DNA'd as a more than a conqueror individual. You're not here to survive. You're here to thrive. That's who you are. So if you're just surviving, then you're not serving the God that I'm serving. You have a misrepresentation of that God, and I want to introduce you to him. I dare you this week. I dare you this week, step in, step in and say, no more surviving. Lord, I want to be in your yard, in your direction. I want your cause. And you go for it. Go for it. That's why I hate the word balance. I hate it. 
this, 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 this Western Christianity, you got to balance your life. Balance it because you're going to give everything's perfect time. And if it's not perfectly normal, then you need to take time away from God and get your life balanced. That comes from the very rectal area of Satan. That's where it comes from. It's a lie. It's a lie. And we eat it all the time. Weak Christians with no cause whatsoever. And the only cause that they have is he said, she said, and I'm offended. No more. Why can't we go after him with our hearts? Why can't we go after him in intercession and prayer? Why can't we evangelize? Why can't we invite? Why can't we pray? Why can't we have a prayer meeting in Walmart? And be a champion for him. Have a cause. And go for it. I understand that this kind of preaching causes more trouble for me later. But I can't help it anymore. Can't help it anymore. Father, I pray for us as a church. We will be people of your God. Give us a cause, and we will go for it. We're not going to wallow in our sin, in our mistakes. You have forgiven us. You put a new song in our mouth. You gave us a place to stand. You set us on a rock. Father, this church move crossover. We will do what you called us to. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody shout amen. I'm so sorry for keeping you late, Jose. Come close. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, so let me uh, just bless you and, and release you. It's a, a great message. I challenge you guys. It will be online later. Go back and listen to it. Go back and watch it. There's so much here that, will, that just needs to be broken down and meditated on. Um, but I want to challenge all of you. Again, for me. Find something to take it personal. Make, make it personal, you know. And if you're like me, you find it difficult to make things personal for, for somebody you don't know, you know, for, for, you know, families, you know, on the other side of town. But make it personal for your wife, you know, for your kid, for your friend at school, for your boss, for your coworker, you know, for your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle. Find someone and make your cause personal.